The Devonian era was an incredibly chaotic time for southeastern Australia. It was by far the most volcanically active and explosive that this land has ever been. Massive calderas left over from the many ultraplinian and supervolcanic eruptions that occurred here at this point in time are dotted all throughout the state, many of which are still visible today, existing largely in the eastern part of the state with a few notable exceptions. This part of the continent has gone from being a deep ocean 600 million years ago to being thrust up to dry land after numerous tectonic collisions occurred here over the course of about 300 million years. Along with the many subduction events were numerous episodes of rifting too, and both of these situations created the perfect setting for both supervolcanoes and for extremely large explosive volcanoes to form, and that's exactly what happened here. Unfortunately, I have to break this episode up into two parts. This episode will focus on the late Devonian volcanic eruptions, whose fuel was derived from subduction-related processes from tectonic collisions and subsequent erogenies that occurred. In part two, things turn up a notch in intensity and the volcanism that we see here occurred primarily in the early Devonian, at a location in Victoria where a rift formed and the land split apart, allowing vast quantities of magma to exploit this weakness and rise up from the mantle, forming literally dozens of massive volcanic calderas that we can see in present day. So in this series, we're going to take a look at Victoria's largest volcanic structures, I'll show you how I discover them and what tools I use to do so. Victoria is literally dotted with dozens of massive calderas. We have volcanoes here ranging from your ultraplinian forming eruption that could have released anywhere from 100 to 600 plus kilometers cubed of material to the true beasts that release 1000 plus kilometers cubed worth of volcanic material during singular eruptions. Victoria is a truly fascinating state. I'm definitely going to miss out on a few calderas as I'm still discovering new ones today, and I actually just found one a few days ago after looking at this fault map and noticing a circular feature whilst creating the last video on how New Zealand creates earthquakes in Australia. Cheeky plug, but the link to that video is down below in the description. Unfortunately, very little published and easily available research exists on most of these volcanic areas. Like, literally, the amount of studies that have been released to the public or are just Googleable in general are absolutely none for most of these cold eras, which makes me sad inside. But that is also why I continue to discover volcanic calderas on my own, which is a kind of fun hobby in a way because there's nothing I enjoy more than discovering new cold eras and kind of nerding out on how powerful it must have been when it had erupted. The first supervolcanic caldera that we are going to look at is the Cerberian caldera. Unlike the following volcanic calderas that we're going to look at after this, there is actually good research available to the public on this caldera. The volcanic entity that spawned this eruption and several other large ones is known as the Marysville Igneous Complex. Just south of the Cerberian caldera exists another moderately large caldera called the Archeron caldera, which shared the same magma chamber and was a smaller version of it. The Cerberian caldera released at least 1,000 kilometers cubed worth of material and was definitely a VEI-8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, meaning yes, it was a supervolcanic eruption of tremendous proportion, with it more than likely having significant planet-altering impacts in the form of a volcanic winter, among other things. And some Australian geologists think it might have been responsible for, or at the very least contributed to, the Devonian extinction event. This cauldron erupted more than once, so it's possible it's covering past supervolcanic eruptions since layers of ignimbrite from differing eruptions do exist here. Before we go on, it's worth explaining what ignimbrite is for any of our new viewers so they can conceptualize and understand what I mean by it during the dozen or more times that I'll mention it in this video. When explosive volcanoes erupt, they release a pyroclastic flow. This is essentially a very dense, semi-molten cloud of death in the form of noxious gases and volcanic particles that hugs the ground when it's released, and it travels at ridiculous speeds of up to 700 kilometers per hour, which is 435 miles per hour for you Yanks out there. It exists at a temperature so hot it will instantly bake you to crispy nothingness, with most of these pyroclastic flows being up to 1000 degrees Celsius, which is a ridiculous 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. When pyroclastic flows cool down and solidify into rock, they are called ignimbrites. 
which to further define, Google tells me is a volcanic rock consisting essentially of pumice fragments formed by the consolidation of material deposited by pyroclastic flows. Thanks, Google. When supervolcanoes erupt, they release a truly unbelievable amount of ignimbrite. The pyroclastic flows are just beyond imaginable. So the last mega eruption that occurred at the Cerberian caldera did so around 365 million years ago, and the original caldera rim size was 27 kilometers in diameter, but erosion has since whittled that down. With that being said though, you can still make it out on Google Maps when using satellite view, which is just incredible. The ignimbrite flows that were released buried the surrounding areas in up to 300 meters worth of ignimbritic rhyolite, and following this, a second tough layer was released which buried the surrounding land in 900 meters worth of rhyodacite. When we switch to the geological map, you can very clearly make out an outline that will become familiar to you as you continue to watch this video. This is how normal faults look in Victoria, a roughly east to west compression line that was created from the numerous subduction events that occurred here. These faults are basically the remains of the land being folded and compressed to the point of breaking and snapping apart when this land was aggressively uplifted from a deep sea. Now this is a ring dike. Notice just how different these are to vertical subduction related faults? Oh, and those lines that you see through them are called ring faults. This is a very common thing to see when very large supervolcanic or extremely large volcanic eruptions occur. They absolutely decimate the ground to such an extent that they fault it when the caldera collapses in upon itself after sufficient magma has drained from the magma chamber. And it produces these ring-like shapes, and the faults can serve as conduits for future magma to rise up from. When the Cerberian caldera collapse occurred, it dropped between 1 to 2 kilometers into the earth, which is kind of unbelievable to think about. Now just south of the Cerberian caldera, we have the Archeron caldera. Similar to the Cerberian one, we have a ring dike with faults striking through it. The tough layer it released is predominantly rhyodacite, and this occurred around the same time as the Cerberian super eruption, since it shared the same magmatic source. Now check out what happens when we click on the magnetics. Bam! Suddenly we can see the outline of both calderas. Isn't that truly incredible? It drowns out all of the uninteresting stuff, leaving only this behind. This isn't always the case though with all calderas, but with these two it's really striking just how clear we can see the features. Moving on, and now we're heading just a little north of the Cerberian caldera. This is my most recent discovery. Upon taking a closer look, I found a few ignimbrite tough layers here that were released during the late Devonian. The Ryan's Creek ignimbrite and the Toombalup ignimbrite are the two predominant tough layers that we see outcropping on the surface. But there exists at least two other falsic eruptions that occurred here with one of these spawning another ignimbrite layer called the Holland's Creek ignimbrite, which released a layer that was 300 meters deep. My suspicions for this place turned out to be correct. It's known as the Ptolemy Igneous Complex, a sub-aerial caldera. Sub-aerial basically means when this eruption occurred it did so above water and not in a submerged state. A little side note, we also have the Whitlands Volcanic Group existing here, and this is a repeating theme that will occur along with the many other volcanic structures that we will look at. It is a much more recently erupted basaltic lava flow that occurred here within the past 50 million years, and the fault conduits that it used to ascend were probably the same faults that were created during these massive explosive eruptions, which I personally find interesting and fascinating, but I digress. On the magnetics, we don't see much, which is misleading, true? I mean, clearly ignimbrite was released here on a massive scale, so what gives? Well, as always, geology is all about understanding that there is never a one-size-fits-all situation and things always differ. Because when we look at the fault map, we can very clearly see a semi-ring dike feature along with ring faults. Perhaps eruptions that followed hid what lay here from magnetics or covered it up, but the faults don't lie. It's very possible that this was as large or even larger than the Cerberian caldera just based on the size of this structure. Unfortunately, like I previously mentioned, I find it extremely difficult to find proper studies on Victorian volcanoes. If anyone knows where I can find this info, please do let me know. This is the best information that I could find for most of the volcanic calderas. It was previously known as the Rose River Volcanics, and the Ryan's Creek Ignimbrite covered the land in a layer that is a ridiculous 450 meters deep. 
The accompanying tomb below Ignambrite was even larger. It released a layer that is 700 meters deep. If I was to guess the shape of the calderas, I would guess that this would be it. With that being said though, two other major eruptions did also occur here, so I could be wrong. I just wanted to say, if this video gets enough likes, I'm going to go in person to each one of these locations to do a further deep dive into them and to create individual episodes based on them. And I'll also shoot some drone footage so that we can marvel at the size of these calderas and see whether or not we can identify it visually in present day. So if that's something you'd genuinely like to see, please leave a like on the video to let me know, as I'd really be keen to do a full series of videos where we go from one supervolcanic location to the next. The next caldera we have is a bit of a weird one. It's weird because it doesn't look like a caldera at all, anymore. Nowadays, it exists as a mountain. The Dandenong Ranges Igneous Complex, also known as the Dandenong Ranges, or more affectionately as the Nongs, is an area that all Victorians have heard of. The mountain can be seen from almost all corners of the surrounding Melbourne CBD and the outlying suburbs. This mountain isn't really a mountain in the traditional sense, rather the extremely erosion resistant volcanic material has remained and the surrounding land has eroded and whittled down around it over the course of its 360 odd million year long life, leaving this massive mountain in present day, which is basically the remains of a now eroded caldera. When we switch to the geological map, we can see that this entire mountain is actually comprised of four ignimbrite flows of varying amounts. We have one rhyolite eruption that released the cold stream rhyolite, whose depth isn't stated on the stratigraphic units database, and along with this it also released three rhyodacite eruptions. The Fernie Creek eruption released a layer that buried the surrounding earth in 400 meters of rhyodacite ignimbrite. And the Calorama and Mount Evelyn rhyodacite tuff layers were both at 300 meters in depth. Even though this material is erosion resistant, it has eroded quite a bit. As you can see by these very rounded shapes, and by the fact that magnetics aren't too strong here at all. And just like before, alongside these massive ignimbrite flows, exists a much more recent lava flow, that more than likely ascended from the very same fault lines created by these massive eruptions, and it itself is known as the Monbulk Volcanic Group, and it released extremely runny basaltic lava flows, which would have created vast lava rivers that would have flowed in the surrounding land. In present day, the caldera or calderas that were created by these volcanic eruptions is less obvious, primarily because everything has eroded to such a great degree that though there does exist a ring dike like shape here, it's much harder to make out because the area that this exists in hasn't really experienced much uplift compared to the other two igneous complexes that we just looked at, which in present day exist within the Alps, and the Alps are still growing at a rate of 76 meters every million years or so in present day, and the Dandenongs exist just outside this range. Since we've been discussing Mount Dandenong, I might as well jump to the next volcanic structure that is equally as well known and is very similar to Mount Dandenong in the fact that it is also far away from the Alps, and because of this it exists as a mountain amongst much flatter land that has eroded around it. It was this exact volcanic structure that made me want to create the content that I make today on this channel over four years ago when I first set out to create it, so I hold a very deep reverence for it. Mount Macedon is known formally as the Macedon Igneous Complex, and it is comprised of two ignimbrite flows and one intrusive event that created the Beringo Granodiorite in present day. Just like all the volcanics discussed thus far, this occurred in the late Devonian, and the two tough layers here are known as the Willemy Gongong and Hesket Ignimbrite flows. The Willemy Gongong Ignimbrite is comprised of rhyodacite, and the maximum depth of it is unknown because of the extreme amounts of erosion that has taken place in the past 360 odd million years since it formed, but at least 400 meters of it exists today. The Hesket Ignimbrite flows underlies the Willemy Gongong Ignimbrite, and it has no information on the depth documented, which is extremely disappointing. The magnetics do show a very faded ring-shaped outline, and just like before, all around Mount Macedon are younger basalt flows, including some that occurred in the middle of the mountain itself, meaning this basalt rose up amongst all the ignimbrite rocks, melted some of them, and erupted onto the surface as trachyte lava en masse in and around the entire mountain. After Macedon, we head back east to our last volcano of this episode. 
The Violet Town Volcanic Group, comprising of one singular rhyodacite ignimbrite flow with a depth that I can't seem to find. This volcanic complex was quite hard to find information on. It erupted 373 million years ago and the present day outcrop is very, very heavily eroded. When looked at through magnetics, we barely see any signs of a cold era. But if we look at it through a new feature, which I haven't showed you yet, called gravity, we can see something a little different. If I was to guess, based on this scan and the one circular fault that we've mapped so far, I'd say it might have had a structure like this. But this is a big shot in the dark and this is pretty big. But it is possible, and along with this volcanic feature are massive amounts of intrusives that followed. So this pretty much concludes the late Devonian eruptions of significance that are visible in present day. If I missed any areas, please do let me know. In part 2, things turn up quite a notch. We go back in time from the late Devonian to the early Devonian when Victoria began to be rifted apart. This rift zone created a much more aggressive form of volcanism than the subduction related calderas that we covered in this episode. And by aggressive, I really do mean aggressive. And along with this, in the next episode, we are going to use a lot more gravity scans whilst continuing to rely on magnetics, geological maps, and fault maps. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. If you found this video interesting or fascinating, then you're probably a little into earth science or science in general. I release new videos once a week, so consider subscribing and if you'd like to help the channel out, the best way that you can contribute and make a huge difference is by sharing our videos around first and foremost, followed by liking the video to let YouTube know we're doing something right. Thanks again for supporting the channel, it really does mean the world to me, and like always, I'll see you all real soon.